Voting Chaos, a puppet on a string and a song about the nuclear threat. Let's talk about Eurovision 1967. Welcome to Eurovision Histories, the series in which I watch old editions of Eurovision so you don't have to. The 12th Eurovision Song Contest was held at the Hofburg in Vienna by actress Erika Wahl. She greeted the participating nations as well as the broadcasting nations, many of them in Eastern Europe, in their own languages, including in Russian. Dobry vecher. As she did not learn greetings in all languages, she promised to do that for the next contest held in Austria. Ladies and gentlemen of Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, Finland, Portugal and Yugoslavia, I would have also liked to welcome you in your native tongue, but time was too short for me to learn them. But should there be another contest in the near future in Vienna, I shall do my best Erika Wall, to also please you. Malicious tongues purport that this is the reason why Austria only managed to win again in 2014, one year after Miss Wahl was unfortunately not with us anymore. She might have wanted to invest more time in rehearsing the voting sequence instead of her language skills, however, but more on that later. Denmark left Eurovision for a 12-year hiatus. The new director of Danish television thought that it was a waste of money. Ooh. Ooh. Really? There were thus only 17 participating countries. In an effort to make Eurovision more current, half of the jury's members had to be under 30 years old. The staging was a bit strange as two large mirrors next to the singers started to turn during the performance, suggesting movement where there was none. This was the last edition not to be broadcast in color and the commentators found ever more creative ways to describe the many colorful outfits the singers were wearing. Monaco sent Minouche Barelli, the only artist ever to represent represent Monaco, who actually lived in the principality at some point in her life. The song was written by Serge Gainsbourg of Poupée de Cire, Poupée de Sans Fame. Two years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the song makes direct references to the nuclear threat facing Europe, apart from the sexual innuendo necessary in any Gainsbourg song, of course. Oh, it includes several countdowns and Barelli sings that she just wants to love before everything goes up in flames with a boom, bada boom. Monaco came fifth. Greek singer Vicky Leandros represented Luxembourg with the beautiful L'Amour est Bleu. The song became the biggest hit of the 1967 contest along with the winner. An instrumental version by Paul Marriott even made it to number one on the American Hot 100. The song compares the ups and downs of love to colors and the elements. Vicky Leandros would of course return for Luxembourg in 1972 and managed to win the competition then. In 1967 she only came fourth. Singing second probably didn't help her chances. Portugal sent Eduardo Nascimento, originally from Angola. Apparently, Portuguese dictator Salazar wanted to show Europe that he was not racist and how happy people in his colonies were to be part of Portugal. Meanwhile, the Angolan War of Independence had been raging since 1961 and only ended with Angola's independence in 1975. Nascimento came 12th with only three points. Freddy represented Finland with a song about not wanting to be famous and in the spotlight. Great voice and a dramatic performance, but maybe participating in Eurovision is not the best way to stay out of the spotlight? Or is it? Freddy came 12th and he returned in 1976 with a happier song. And now I've seen everything. Rafael returned for Spain with Hablemos del Amor, slightly less intense than his offering the year before. He certainly knew how to work the camera. His sixth place was the best result for Spain up to that point. There was also a null point. Geraldine from Switzerland sang her underwhelming song so off-key that she probably deserved coming last. And 
now I've seen everything. The Netherlands sent Therese's Steinmetz with the fun but slightly Christmassy Ring Ding a Ding. <laughs> Very eurovision -y, but it did not convince the jurors and only came 14th. Ireland achieved its best result ever coming second with the, dare I say, slightly boring If I Could Choose by Sean Dunphy. If I could choose a place to walk with you, I'd choose the longest road. In the song he professes that he would leave the green hills of Clare behind and live in a desert if only he had his lover with him. Vse Roje Sveta was the second song in Slovenian to represent Yugoslavia and is apparently an anti-war song. It talks about a young man being shot in a field and calls on people to live their spring because it only comes once in a lifetime. Eighth place was the result. Interestingly, it shared its place with Germany's Anushka. In the song, the titular character is told that she should not cry as her lover will return once spring comes along. This was Germany's best result since 1962. Sweden sent Östen Warnerbrink, who participated in Melodie Festival in 11 times, but only made it to Eurovision once. In 1960, his song had won the competition, but Siv Malmquist was chosen to perform it at Eurovision. His Som en Dröm only came eighth. <laughs> Italy sent Claudio Villa, who had already represented the country in 1962. He holds the record for the most wins at the Sanremo Festival together with Domenico Modugno. Unfortunately, his luck at Eurovision was similar to Modugno's and his very dramatic Non andare più lontano only came 11th. Amore. Norway sent a song about a puppet master, which was thematically quite similar to the eventual winner. <laughs> Kirsti Sparbø had represented Norway in 1965 and would do so again in 1969. She is one of the least successful artists ever, achieving a grand total of four points across her three participations. <sighs> Dukeman received two points and came 14th. France's Il doit faire beau là-bas, about a lover who leaves to another country where the weather must be nice, was written by the winning songwriters of the 1958 Eurovision Song Contest and was equally as boring. Il doit faire beau The jury still liked it and it came third. The voting at the 1967 Eurovision Song Contest was one of the most chaotic in the contest's history. I wonder, could you stop just a moment, please? We, we're out of order with the board. This was, among other things, due to a rule change. As four countries had come last with no points in the previous editions, now all ten jurors in each country could give one point to their favorite song, which meant that the total amount of points received by a song reflected the number of jurors that had it as their favorite. However, this also resulted in a more complicated voting procedure, and additionally, the scoreboard didn't quite work, so Mr. Brown, the supervisor of the EBU, had to interrupt proceedings several times. Can you mark the 15 votes for France, please? It's still showing oh, five Oh, I'm so votes. sorry, it's 16. Uh, France would be the second, and Luxembourg the... S no? 15 votes. Thank you very much. I think we'll continue with the vote. <laughs> I can't see the board very well from here. Which visibly made host Erika Wahl increasingly nervous. Her plea... I hope our technical order... I mean, disorder <laughs> will get in order in a few seconds. Is still a classic Eurovision phrase. For instance, Austria suddenly had 12 points instead of two after Yugoslavia's vote. There were a lot of. I'm so sorry. So I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Throughout the night, and eventually, Valls was so nervous that she announced the UK's win before the Irish jury had even given its votes. Meine Damen und Herren, 
der Sieger beim Song Contest 1967 in Wien. Still waiting for the Irish vote. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Good evening, Dublin. Could we have your votes, please? I thought we were going to be left out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> At the end of the show, she was so confused that she couldn't utter a clear sentence anymore. Einmal mehr, meine Damen und Herren. Nun, den Song Contest, the Prix of the Grand Eurovision, Puppet on the String with Sandy Shaw. It all didn't matter that much, however, as the UK led throughout the voting, not least due to seven points from Switzerland, Norway and France, and eventually had double the points of second place Ireland. Sandy Shaw performed Puppet on a String with such verve and, incidentally, barefoot, that the commanding win was not really a surprise. <laughs> Her outfit was straight out of swinging London and Eurovision seemed prepared for the upheaval of the late 60s. Out of the five songs she presented at the British national final, she liked Puppet on a String the least and regularly slammed its sexist lyrics and uninspired melody. The lyrics are indeed a bit problematic as she sings that she will gladly be there like a puppet on a string if only her lover says that he cares. Yikes. However, the song got her another number one in the UK and became a hit all over Europe. It was the most successful winner up to that point. There are over 200 versions in at least 30 languages. By the way, this was the first time that scenes from the green room were shown during the voting sequence and viewers got a first row seat to Udo Jürgens chatting up Sandy Shaw, who ignored and very publicly rejected him. The interval act that year were the world famous Wiener Sängerknaben by away. Okay, that's enough of that. If you liked this episode, please like and subscribe and come back for my episode on Eurovision 1968. See you then. Bye bye.